Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, and happy International Women's Day. I'm Jorge Mena Robles, Associate Director here at the LCC. Thank you for joining us uh, for this Zona Abierta online program, and many thanks to our co-sponsors, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Engagement, and the Department of Biological Sciences for supporting this program. Uh, Zona Abierta is a Latino Cultural Center program series which highlights the intersection of arts, humanities, science, culture, and civic life with presentations by local, national, and international artists, scholars, and community leaders. Today's program is the second of three presentations that the LCC is hosting this semester for a continued series titled Radical Research from BIPOC Scholars at UIC with scholars who joined the Bridge to Faculty program at UIC. Um, individually, they will be sharing their experiences and respective research through an, using an intersectional lens revealing the complexity and particularity of their research and how their lives of those in the margins are impacted. Uh, for those who may be unaware, the Bridge to Faculty program is a recruitment initiative in the Office of Diversity, designed specifically to attract underrepresented postdoctoral, excuse me, postdoctoral scholars with the goal of direct transition to a tenure track junior faculty position after two years. Um, this series is the second installment um, that we've hosted. We hosted four speakers in the spring of 2016 2002 um, last year, and you can view all of those presentations on our LCC YouTube. Uh, we will share that link in the chat for, for folks to find those previous presentations. Now, uh, I am delighted to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Gabriela Nunez Murr. Dr. Nunez Murr is a quantitative ecologist and a third generation conservationist from the Dominican Republic. Dr. Gabriela Nunez Murr received her PhD from the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at Purdue University. And she joined the Bridge to Faculty program in the UIC Department of Biological Sciences after serving as a postdoctoral fellow at Virginia Commonwealth University. Today's presentation by Dr. Gabriela Nunez Murr will focus on her research on an invasive insect pest that have de devastating effects on forest ecosystems. Her research takes advantage of the extensive amount of spatial and temporal distributional data available for this highly um, damaging forest pest, uh, which is more recently known as the spongy moth per the Entomological Society of America, in order to explore regional patterns on the local dynamics of it, if it's invasive spread. Um, the presentation today will be about 35 minutes, followed by a short conversation facilitated by our program coordinator, Jocelyn Munguia Chavez. And we invite you to put comments and questions on the chat so that Jocelyn can direct these to our speaker um, near the end of the program. Again, welcome, bienvenida. Gabby, I'll send it over to you. Hey everyone, it's such an honor to be here. First of all, I'd love to um, thank the LCC for inviting me <laughs> to give this talk. Um, I'm very, very excited to share with you this research. Um, Give me a second to actually get this in presentation mode. Does everyone see the screen presentation? Yes, amazing. All right, so as Jorge was saying in that lovely introduction, thank you for that. Um, I work with invasive species, but the way that I approach the study of invasive species might be a little bit different from what you have seen before. So today I'd like to introduce to you a new perspective on how to study this socioecological phenomenon um, in through a big picture or a wide lens, so to speak. So before I go any further, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what these species even are. And it might be a very familiar topic for some of you, maybe not so much for others. Certainly these species touch every aspect of our lives, even outside of these natural environments. So invasive species are organisms that are brought into places where they don't naturally occur. And then they become established, they spread, um, and then they ultimately cause great damage and harm, not just to our ecological systems, but also to human health, to the economy. Uh, what we are seeing right now in the screen are different examples of these species, both plants and um, animals. So in the right, um, at the top, 
We have an, a, an example of, I believe this one's garlic mustard, spread all over the forest floor, just consuming everything. What's underneath that is burn, no, no that is definitely a bush um, honeysuckle or Ramnus cathartica, one of the, of the two. I've changed these pictures pretty often <laughs> and I study all these species, so I don't have a great, uh, right now, can't remember which one exactly is this, but it's a, Bush, an invasive bush, as you can see, it has taken over the understory, competing and changing what the understory looks like. Some of these forests before are just bare land, um, and that's the way that it works for all the species living there. But now it's changed structurally that landscape. On the left, you'll see examples of a wood borer. Um, in the bottom, as you can see, making already causing mortality to these trees. And on the top is quagga mussel, causing actual damage, not just to the lakes, it's infested the Great Lakes, but also to human property. And um, these species cost the United States upwards of $1.2 billion a year, and that's billion with a B, just in damages. So it's a really serious issue, not just environmentally, but also socially. That's why we call it a socio-ecological challenge. Now, in my lab, um, the Macro Scale Ecology and Conservation Research Lab, we focus on studying these species at very large scales, um, which some people might be unfamiliar with that. They're used to being in the field. Um, folks usually ask me, well, <laughs> Have you ever actually seen these species, which might also indicate why I couldn't um, identify their pictures? And no, in fact, we are dealing with the numbers and patterns and large data sets, taking advantage of all the hard work that people are putting in to collecting this data to actually um, discover, uncover patterns of these species at very large scale, so regional to continental, and the processes underlying these patterns. Now, let's talk a little bit about invasion as a multi-scale problem. Um, the processes, the drivers that influence invasion, species invasions, um, are varied. Some of them might be really small scale. Let's talk about maybe microhabitats, soil characteristics. Those are things that may change across a few meters. Um, biotic interactions, very, very small scale. However, there are other drivers of invasions that occur over really large scales, maybe even continental, things like um, transportation networks across continents or climate. So generally or traditionally, research on invasive species, as I've been alluding to, has focused on that on the more localized scales, local to regional, which is still greatly important to have that localized knowledge on these species, certainly, but it does leave a gap on our understanding on how these larger scale drivers such as climate or transportation movement um, operate and interact with smaller scale drivers. And also it leaves us a little bit in the dark as to what these patterns of invasion look like at very large scales, which would be really helpful in cases where we don't have localized knowledge of invasive species, such as for new invaders, which happens all the time. Uh, right now, um, if maybe you guys have heard about the spotted lanternfly that is spreading ac across the Northeast. A few years ago, it was only known in Pennsylvania or only been seen in Pennsylvania. I remember because I was teaching an invasion ecology class and we talked about it. And now it's up in New York, it's down in North Carolina, um, it's all over. And that's the issue, right? Um, once they get uh, established and are spreading, it's impossible to eradicate them. It would take an immense amount of resources and time to do so in a way that is prohibitive. So we are here in the Nunez Mir Mech Lab to understand um, these broader characterization of these species uh, to be able to, one, derive generalizations of what could be happening at large scales so that when there is there are species that are relatively new introductions, we can take advantage of that large scale knowledge. And large scale can be spatial scale, but also um, across taxonomic groups. So sometimes when I say scale, it could be spatial, and I'll make sure to specify that. But sometimes it means that we're looking at many species at the same time.
Today, however, I will be talking about just one species, um, the spongy moth, Lumantra dispar. Uh, the spongy moth actually just had a name change really recently. The former name was an offensive term or contained an offensive term, so you may or may not recognize this species, particularly if you're from the Northeast or if you live in more forested areas here in the Midwest or have lived. Um, so maybe through the pictures, <laughs> you'll be able to recognize the species. If not, you're welcome to search on your own time what the previous name was. So we'll be in um, some studies on the patterns of spongy moth invasion and its management at very large scale, so at the macro scale, spatial scale. So let's start, let's start with some history on spongy moth. It is one of those few species that we know exactly where it came from and how it came and everything. So spongy moth was actually introduced by a person um, in Massachusetts, Medford, I believe. And there's a plaque in this person's what used to be their home uh, <laughs> 100 some years ago. And this person loved animals from other places. And um, he had in his travels discovered this um, caterpillar that produce uh, silk, just like silk caterpillars and thought, well, maybe this would be an easier way to make silk and brought it to the US or Massachusetts. And as you might imagine, a couple years later, this thing had escaped and it was all over. In fact, the picture that we're seeing right now is um, early control efforts by a management crew up in a tree in the 1800s trying to figure out <laughs> how are we going to eradicate or eliminate this um, this moth, these caterpillars going all over. I mean, imagine if all of a sudden your, <laughs> your backyard is infested by a carpet of these things. It must have been really destabilizing for these folks. Nowadays, um, the spongy moth has invaded more than a million kilometers squared of the northeastern United States. So from Massachusetts, it went all the way up to Maine, all the way down to North Carolina, and all the way west to the eastern tip of Minnesota. So it spread quite a bit. Um, and we wouldn't be talking about spongy moth today if it was just a cute little moth, as they say, that might be a little bit of a nuisance sometimes. Nope. The big issue with spongy moth is that it causes large scale defoliation events. So when it outbreaks, these species are quite voracious and they'll eat mostly anything. They prefer oaks, but they're um, their feeding breadth um, of the species that they will consume is quite broad. So once they're outbreaking, there's an outbreak, they can cause defoliation events of 700 to 50,000 kilometers squares of defoliated forest annually. Um, so uh, as you can imagine, these events cause not just widespread mortality of trees and sometimes, um, and also the cascading um, effects to other species beyond these trees, but also millions, hundreds of millions of dollars um, to timber industry and other industries, including recreational parks. And there's just effects to everyone involved when it comes to spongy moth. So it's quite, quite, quite troublesome. Uh, I've heard from people who have been in the middle of an outbreak that they will start climbing up your legs and falling on you from trees. They cause um, irritation to the skin if they're on you. It's not great. <laughs> so because it's such an insidious species or it causes, it's so damaging, um, there is a specific organization sponsored by the USDA called Slow the Spread. Now the Slow the, so the, Slow the Spread Foundation um, is in charge of both the monitoring of the species and the control of the species. So the treatments to um, suppress or eradicate new colonies of these species or new groups of these species. So talking about the monitoring side, this is actually one of the best documented invasive species in North, in North America. They have been monitoring the folks that slow the spread Monitoring spongy moth um, along a transition zone, which I will explain in a few seconds, via pheromone beta traps. So they deploy um, over 80,000 traps a year and then count 
the amount of moths that show up on the trap. So that way they can keep an, um, an account of how it's spreading, but also which areas are having high density outbreaks um, and other population dynamics along those lines. So as I said, they monitor around a transition zone. So can everyone see my mouse clicker right now, the pointer? Or should I use a pointer like this? Oop. Does this work? Yeah, awesome. Yes, that works. Okay. So um, what is an, oh my gosh, I think, oh, never mind, that was before. Um, so the transition zone is the area between infested areas here in, in red. This is, by the way, on um, a map of Ohio. So how it looked like for 2023, the boundaries for the STF project. So the infested areas are in red, the uninfested are in white. So they monitor across this area that encompasses both of those things, uh, of those zones. Um, and it encompasses that leading population edge so that they can see where it's moving. And they've been doing this um, from North Carolina to Wisconsin since 1985. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of data on um, spongy moth and how they've moved throughout um, the United States. So on the other side, they don't just monitor, they use this information from the monitoring, not just to understand, but also to deploy suppression and eradication treatments along this population front. And they do that using an algorithm, a decision algorithm, they call, they call it, um, that identifies pro potential problem areas and prioritizes them for treatment. As you can imagine, there's not enough resources to just spray everywhere, right? So they have to identify these areas that will hopefully slow the spread and keep them as far back in that in, in that leading population edge as still as possible. So the issue is that this decision algorithm at the moment only takes in information on where these Potential, uh, potential problem areas, including nascent um, groups of spongy moth, where they are located, um, how far they are from the leading population edge, um, latitude. They only take information about the demographics of the moths that are there and geographic information, but not so much about the actual environment and the habitats where these are happening. And as you can imagine, certain forest stands might be more vulnerable to establishment by spongy moth than others. So um, in conversations with uh, the folks at Slow the Spread, which is such a rewarding um, part of science for me, being able to feed into the actual management on the ground um, conservation, and in this case, not conservation, um, but mitigation of invasive species. So we decided, well, let's test which, uh, which of these drivers that are A, known to be important for spongy moth biology and ecology, and B, known to be important for invasion in general, which of these actually play a role in making an area more or less susceptible in increasing or decreasing that invasion rate of spongy moth? So that's what we set out to do. Which of these characteristics will make an area um, become more quickly invaded than others? So to do so, we spatially gridded the transition zone into five by five kilometers um, cells in ArcGIS, which is a geographic information system software. And uh, we obtained the average number of moths caught in each of these cells from 1985 to 2015. So we had those about 30 years across the entire transition zone of annual counts of moths um, in each of these cells. But then a question came up. How do we know if an area is invaded? How can we determine if each driver is, I mean, we can't even get into which drivers are more important if we don't even know um, if an area within a you know, systematic way if an area is invaded or not. Sometimes it'll be very obvious. You don't know for sure. So um, usually, traditionally, the way that practitioners and researchers in spongy moth research have done this is they have set this specific threshold. If there are more than 10 moths in a trap, this area is considered invaded. 
Now, there's an issue with having an arbitrary threshold like that, and it's that it doesn't take into account the stochasticity of population dynamics um, and things like Ali effects, which might um, move, might make it more, um, how do we say, um, unpredictable what that population will look like in future years. So maybe the year after, and they found there were 10 moths, maybe you'll have 50 moths. And yeah, you were right. It was an area that has been, uh, have an established um, population of spongy moths, and now it'll continue spreading. Or maybe you'll have, sorry, maybe you'll have zero moths the next year. And that may happen because of the stochasticity um, of population dynamics. So instead, we decided to take a probabilistic approach. So instead of saying, okay, we'll set a threshold with the number of moths, we will look at things as, all right, what is the probability that there will be zero moths in a cell in a given year? And to do that, we used a um, statistical method called Bayesian Structural Time Series. And we used this um, time series to calculate the probability that there would be zero moths in a cell in a given year. Now, these are really cool. I'm not going to get super into mathematics of it, but it was a um, modeling approach developed by the head of data science at Google. And it's one of my favorite parts of my job, just having these crazy questions and going out there and seeing what other people in other fields are doing um, to analyze data. So conceptually, let me explain to you how it works. So Bayesian models, the way that they work, especially for predictions, is that they will create um, a latent or a posterior distribution of probabilities of what you will see. Um, in this case, if we had, let's say, the number of moths, so a time series from 1990 to 1993, so in 1990 we have zero, then four, then three, then two, and we want to predict how many moths we would have in 1994 given that time series, um, then we would use the Bayesian distribution and given the distribution that this hypothetical distribution that I'm showing you, the model would spit out, okay, the most likely amount of moths in that year would be three because it's the most likely outcome given this iterations. Now we were more interested in what is the likelihood of getting zero moths. So we used that posterior distribution of this modeling approach to get that probability of having zero moths in a year in a given cell, given the information that we have for counts before that year. Um, defined invasion rates as the number of years between the first detection of spongy moth and the year where the probability of zero moths fell below 0.01. Now we know that that is still setting a threshold, but it's a quite conservative threshold and we're following the general rules of thumb for confidence intervals and other inference um, things. <laughs> So yes, um, so the number of years between these two events determined the invasion rate for a specific cell in the transition zone for spongybob. So be beyond that, we divided the transition zone into three subregions. We had the central, northern, and southeastern because we did assume that there would be some biogeographical differences between the among these three. So we wanted to be able to take that into account whenever we were given management recommendations and also for biology's sake. Now to the fun parts, let's talk about results. So um, we found actually that waiting times across the transition zone were getting progressively longer at the leading edge of the invasion, which was really, really, really cool finding. It's the first empirical evidence at this scale that slowed the spread is actually working. Um, so as you can see, I have overlaid the project bounds for slow the spread and that movement of spongy moth. And you can see that the cooler colors overlap with the STS project bounds. So that was a really cool finding. Um, and that's even, we excluded areas that had been treated by slow the spread. So it was um, very cool to see. Now, when it drivers, which is what we're all here for, um, we found that seasonal temperatures were the most important drivers for uh, an area for invasion rate. So an area would be more or less vulnerable 
primarily due to its temperatures, its mean winter temperatures, and its maximum spring, spring temperatures. So across the entire transition zone, areas with warmer winters and cooler springs were actually more likely to get, got invaded faster than areas that had the opposite characteristics. We also found that anthropogenic uh, fragmentation was detrimental to sponge moth establishment. So it actually slowed down invasion rates. And that um, we also added average waiting time of neighborhood in there because we know that the demographics, if there's a lot of spongy moth surrounding it, obviously that's going to have an effect on how fast an area gets invaded. So we added that as well in there. And as we expected, that and the year of initial detection had a strong effect on the patterns that we observed. Now, when we broke it down into different geographical regions, we see really similar patterns, which was so encouraging. Um, temperatures, seasonal temperatures are at the top for each of these different regions. In the central regions, it seems more similar to the general transition zone, which makes sense. Cool, colder winters. And, um, and warmer summers, uh, springs, sorry, I think I turned that around last time, um, are bad for spongy moth. Now, in this case, summer precipitation is also important, human population density also important. Um, things get tricky when we move to the north and the south. Now, in the northern regions of the transition zone, if you have both cold winters and cold springs, that's a problem. So, well, a problem for the spongy moth, it's good for us. Um, so invasion rates are slower in areas that have colder winters and colder springs. So now we're not caring anymore about these really warm springs. On the other hand, in the Southeast, we see that the temperatures in the winter are not that important anymore. In fact, the most important thing, um, other than average waiting time of the neighborhood and year of initial detection, is uh, spring temperatures. If it's too hot in the spring, spongy moth cannot withstand those temperatures. And I have colleagues who are studying the effects of supraoptimal, so hotter temperatures for spongy moth development at large, uh, sorry, at very small scale, so at the organismal scale, how it affects them. So it is the first time, it was really cool talking to them, first time that we see empirical evidence of there being a contraction situation happening at the southeastern part of the range because of the supraoptimal temperatures. So cool stuff. This allowed us to put together um, some management guidelines for STS and other groups that are performing uh, eradication and suppression um, treatments for spongy moth. So as I said before, high priority should be plots that have warmer winters, cooler springs, and less anthropogenic fragmentation. And low priority should be those areas with colder winters, hotter springs, with more um, anthropogenic fragmentation. So that will help the prioritization of those problem areas so that these treatments and where they are allocated is just much more effective when it comes to slowing the spread of the species. Now, that being said, I'm going to change the topic a little bit. We were talking a lot about how to treat spongy moth, but you guys don't really know how do we treat spongy moth. Generally, the treatment of spongy moth happens um, or is carried out with a biopesticide called BTK. BTK stands for Bacillus thuringiensis variety Christaki. It's a species of bacteria. So what this bacteria does, it produces this um, endotoxin. It's this crystal that um, gets deposited on the leaves. And then when the caterpillars, the larvae of the species consumes it, it dissolves their stomachs pretty much. So <laughs> a highly targeted um, biopesticide widely used, widely used and widely used all over the world because it is quite targeted, but not super targeted. It affects all lepidopterans. And guess who else are lepidopterans? Monarch butterflies and other beautiful butterflies that we wish to protect, right? So um, in my work with Slow the Spread, uh, it came up that folks, everyday folks, 
or complaining a lot whenever there were people, those crews that go out and deploy the treatment, they would get yelled at. Um, actually, planes that deploy that spray of BTK would get shot at. Um, it would be really problematic and people were just really concerned. Among other things, a lot of concern for monarch butterflies. So we set out to actually study, empirically study, is there an overlap between these two conservation um, goals right now? One is decreasing spongy moth, and the other one is protecting the monarch butterfly. Now, conflicting conservation goals are not super uncommon in conservation practice. Why? Because of resources and just the way that life works sometimes. Another example of a conservation conflict like this happens in Florida. So we have this invasive apple snail, really awful thing. It came in with an invasive aquatic plant, a hydrilla uh, species. And so there are efforts to decrease these the apple snail, which causes um, problems to human health and um, animals of interest. And the on the other hand, we have the endangered Florida snail kite, which has been increasing in numbers because it has been feeding on the apple snail. So what do you do? Do you choose to maintain the apple snail and leave it as a feeding source for the endangered Florida snail kite? Or do you just ignore that and control, you know, conflicting <laughs> conservation goals? So now it, the purpose of this study was to figure out is the control of spongy moth and the conservation of monarch butterflies in conflict with each other. So let's a little bit more context of why this should be. Um, monarch butterflies are an iconic species, as we all know. They're migratory, so they're iconic all the way from their overwintering grounds in Michoacan, all the way north to Canada and the United States, where they breed and feed and then fly back down in the fall. So the problem is that these species are highly declining. Um, in the past decade, there has been a population decline of around 80%, and we're not entirely sure or very certainly sure why. There are um, theories out there. Um, and in fact, the movement for conservation has been focusing on restoring and enhancing habitat for um, these monarch butterflies, specifically breeding and feeding habitat. Now, the most prolific breeding and feeding habitat for monarch butterflies happens in the Midwestern states. And recognize this area over here that it looks like some other maps that I've showed you before. It overlaps with the areas where the transition zone of spongy moth is at the moment. So there's an issue there. The VTK treatments to control um, spongy moth are occurring in the same areas that are highly prolific and a conservation priority right now when it comes to monarch butterflies. So very problematic on what's happening here. Um, at the moment, the management experts think that thought, sorry, because now we have more evidence that there wasn't an issue because there wasn't enough overlap in time, but we went out to study that. We do know that BTK has been found to have negative effects on swallowtail butterflies and the, car the endangered carner blue butterfly. So certainly we should be concerned and look into this. So are monarchs at risk from spongy moth VDK applications? We took this as a two-pronged approach. First, we looked at temporal overlap. When are monarch larvae present in VTK treatment blocks? And a spatial overlap. How abundant are monarch larvae in VTK treatment blocks? Now, it's important to note that VTK only affects these species as larvae because, um, I mean, that it, it targets these digestive systems. They get eaten from the leaves and these species. They do all their feeding, most of their feeding um, in that stage as larvae. So we got data from STS again uh, from 283 BTK treatment blocks for spongy moth management from 2015 to 2018. So we got um, information on when these treatments took place across these potential problem areas where 
there were treatments or yeah. And then when it came to Monarch data, we took advantage of this really, really, really great community science program called Journey North. Um, they have over 60,000 sites um, across the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Anyone here in this call right now can go out there if you see a monarch butterfly or any of the other um, species that they track, and you can take a picture, put in your um, coordinates, and it'll go to the database. So it's a really, really, really rich um, data source for tracking um, monarchs after moving north, so their phenology. Um, so we, from them, obtained first sighting data. So the very first time they were observed uh, by a volunteer in that area from 1996 to 2019. We have quite a lot of years of data for monarch arrivals uh, across the United States. Now we focus, we wanted to focus exclusively on that transition zone, obviously, because we want to know, we wanted very high resolution estimates of when we could expect monarch butterflies to be present in those BTK treatment blocks. Um, as you know, we're looking right now at the temporal overlap. And when it comes to monarch butterflies, even though there's a lot of research on them, we don't have those high resolution estimates. And I'm saying high resolution, not just spatially, and we're talking at, at the kilometer by kilometer scale, but also um, temporally. So we're not talking about, well, they arrive between April, mid-April and mid-May. We wanted to get some understanding um, to the date uh, of when they're arriving to this region. So what we did, we took those about 30 years of, or 25 years of data and um, we created for each year interpolated estimates, again, in RGIS, the Geographic Information System software. And we use the technique called Gaussian um, statistical simulations, um, geostatistical simulations, to be able to get an impression for how um, the spread around these estimates, how like a confidence interval of sorts, um, because as you know, this is data that is carried out in a non-systematic way. It's just regular folks like you and I going outside, grabbing the data. So we wanted to have an, um, an understanding of the error that could be surrounding those estimates. So that's why we also got, um, we used the simulations to obtain standard deviation um, around those estimates. So we then averaged all of that to be able to capture that variability year to year in when these monarch butterflies are arriving to the region. And we did that for both the actual estimates and for the standard deviation. As you can see, there's some areas that have lower standard deviations and that's why because of the, you have a higher concentration of folks taking, um, information, uh, whereas areas where there were there was less information will have wider confidence intervals for those. So back to the fun parts, let's talk about the results. We found the monarch butterflies were arriving to, those to the spongy moth transition zone between April 15th and June 15th. And the average date of arrival for these monarchs to the actual treatment blocks, so not just to the region, to the treatment blocks that we talked about, was May 25th. In comparing these two events, um, the graph that's right now on the screen has ordinal date, which is the number of dates from January 1st um, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have um, just the regular order of these events. Uh, we can see that 98% of the initial treatments, I must mention that Sometimes these BTK treatments, they'll have one and then they'll have a follow-up, especially if there are very high densities of spongy moth. So 98% um, of the initial treatments were occurred much before um, the arrival of spongy moth, sorry, of monarch butterflies, which is a good news because when monarch butterflies arrive, they get going really quickly. They arrive, they lay eggs almost immediately, and then these eggs, or they mate, they lay eggs, and these um, 
these eggs are hatching four days later, everything happens really fast. So we want these BTK treatments to happen much before um, the monarchs are there. BTK lasts in the environment about two to three days, so not that long. Um, so that seems good. However, if we take into account the potential error in our estimates, only 2.8% of those treatments actually, um, we can say with 95% confidence that they did not overlap with the presence of monarch larvae. Um, when it came to follow-ups, it was even worse. 84% of these follow-up BTK treatments uh, occurred before uh, with enough space and only 0.5% with 95 confidence. So we're not looking very good when it comes to temporal overlap, or at least we can't say with confidence that there is not enough um, overlap there temporally. Out of the third treatments that occurred after the projected appearance of monarch larvae, 27 were follow-up treatments. So that's a specific area of a um, problematic area there um, and something that we pointed out to management. Now, if we look at this in space, we'll see that if you're moving towards the northernmost latitudes, that's where that overlap is happening more seriously. So you get more blues, more co cooler colors in the central parts of the transition zone and certainly in the southeastern parts. If you can see here, it's all green and blues. And then as you move up, you're getting more reds, more yellows, more oranges, especially over here in Wisconsin. Now, we're not entirely sure if that has to do with management decision or an actual overlap in the phenologies of or the timing of um, monarchs and spongy moth. There is some thought that because these are um, new introduction or not introductions, they have more recently spread into these north spongy moth into these northeastern latitudes. The management still doesn't have a great handle on when to spray for this species. And that's why these overlaps are happening. So that's an area for further research, but certainly geographically, Wisconsin, um, folks over in Wisconsin that take care of the management of uh, spongy moth need to pay attention to that because this is where the highest likelihood for temporal overlap between those two species occurs. Um, sorry, between the treatment of spongy moth and uh, the appearance and emergence of monarch larvae occurs. Now that is one side of the story. If they are overlapping temporally, but not spatially, it might not matter, right? So that's why we took this two prong approach. So let's look at the sp spatial overlap between these two events. Um, the way, the best way to know where monarch larvae are going to be is just knowing where milkweeds are, because as you know, these species feed almost obligately entirely on milkweed species. So um, the abundance of milkweeds is a great indicator for the presence of monarch larvae. To do this, to derive the abundance at this really high spatial resolution, um, we used a tool that was put out by, by the USGS Monarch Conservation Science Partnership um, that is a milkweed calculator. And all that this does is that it takes into account about 42 different habitat types and will project the amount of milkweed um, either by stems or another measure of abundance that are expected in an area. So these are also projections, but um, we believe that they're quite credible and at least it's what we have at the moment. So we took advantage of that. And what we did was that we calculated the area of each habitat class within each of those treatment blocks and then projected the amount of milkweed stems using this calculator, um, including a surrounding buffer of a thousand meters. Why? Because as I said, this BTK is a spray. Sometimes it's even a plane that is spraying it. So there might be a potential for drift and we wanted to account for that. So we thought that an 1000 meter buffer would be um, conservative enough to take into account the drift of that spray, of BTK spray. So we found that um, within these treatment blocks, we have 
26 hectares of milkweed, which it was actually 0.5% of the entire the area in a treatment block, very, very little. To put it more in context for you, um, if we include the treatment blocks and the buffer to uh, that 26, oh, so maybe 0 0.5, sorry, 0 0.5 before it was 5, 5%. It goes down to 2% once we include the buffer. Looking at it from the rest of the region to the surrounding counties, just 0 0.05 percent of the area um, of the milkweed present in those areas. And if we step back even further, just 0.04 percent of the milkweed in the Midwestern United States. So it's not, it does not, these treatment blocks do not represent serious sources for milkweed abundance. So they're not great habitats for monarchs, for starters. So that's really good news. We can, um, Feel more comfortable that the abundance of monarch larvae is going to be quite small in these treatment blocks when compared to the surrounding areas. To dig in deeper a little bit more because it's an endangered species as actually um, last year in July monarch butterflies officially became an endangered species by the IUCN. So we wanted to be, um, be able to give as many recommendations as we can. So um, as we dug in deeper and looked at that, um, how many or how often we would see um, habitat classes in the in these treatment blocks that would be really good for milkweed. So um, we found that the areas with the most milkweed in these treatment blocks were areas that um, encompassed exurban roads and rails, so roads and rails outside of cities, um, herbaceous wetlands, and grasslands and pastures. However, um, spongy moth uh, likes to feed on trees, so it's a forest pest. Most of these treatment blocks were found in forests, as you can see in black. Sorry, let me backtrack and describe these graphs really quickly. So both the one on the left and the one on the right are very similar. Just one is just the treatment blocks. The other one, the treatment blocks with an 1,000 meter buffer. Um, on the x-axis at the bottom of the x-axis, we'll see the percentage of the total area of the BTK treatment block. And the top, the hectares of milkweed found, and this is divided by what we have in the y-axis, the different habitat classes that were found in these blocks. So the most common habitat class in these blocks were forests, as I was saying. Um, yet, exurban roads and rails were the ones that had the most milkweed, and we didn't find many of those habitats in the treatment blocks, which is good news. However, there is something to notice. Oh, sorry, herbaceous wetlands were the third most common um, habitat class in these treatment blocks. And it's the second, or the third, sorry, the third most common um, or a source of milkweed. So there is very, sorry, the second, there's very much of an issue there, um, a potential spatial overlap, which leads to our recommendations. Spongy moth management and monarch conservation are not likely to pose conflicting interests. As we saw, there's not a lot of milkweed there. However, we need to keep an eye out for, as I said before, let me point it out here, grasslands and pastures, not herbaceous wetlands, um, which are both common in BTK treatment plots and also sources, important sources for milkweed. So we recommended that we should, in summary, consider ground-based application or mating disruption, which is another way of treating spongy moth um, in treatment blocks containing these habitat classes, either grasslands and pastures, crossing and adjacent roads and rails um, when it comes to these forests, and herbaceous wetlands. So let's consider something different, uh, much more targeted than BTK. Um, we also recommended to revisit the timing of follow-up treatments, especially in the northern latitudes. So with all of that being said, what did we learn today? We learned that the expanded spongy moth is dependent on temperatures in the winter and spring. And these are really interesting findings because it tells us that the dynamics of spongy moth spread and ecology might change with climate change. So it's something to keep an eye out um, that northern contraction or northern limits to the range might 
become fissile. As we're seeing, winter temperatures are the largest limitant um, to their, or the, the most important limitant to their spread northern, northward. Um, and with warming climates, that might change. On the other hand, we also learned that BTK treatment of spongemoth does not likely pose a threat to monarchs that we can keep spraying the heck out of those pesky moths. And finally, the micro scale studies can produce use useful findings for conservation and management. I like to tell students that feel more indoors inclined like myself that there are different ways of doing ecological science. We don't exclusively have to be in the field. So with that, I'd like to thank my co-authors and my funding sources. Um, this work was funded both by NSF and by the USDA Slow the Spread program. And I'd love to open the floor for questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. I see um, reaction buttons, clapping, yes. Thank you for your presentations and, um, and reading and sharing your research with us. We do have a lot of questions, either logistical or theoretical, for you, but I want to read some of the audience questions first. Um, okay, so it's a twofold question, or three. How long does it take um, to get to a point where species are categorized as invasive? And also, is there a point at which invasive species then become native again? Or are we going to see this transaction happening faster due to climate change? Honestly, a lot of great questions there and very interesting points, philosophical points almost. Um, so right now, there are how to start. Right now, that label of invasive, if we're talking about official governmental terms, um, it has to classify a certain, like a list of things. It's three things, really. First, it has to not be originally, original from North America. So it has to be introduced. It has to be non-native. Um, the second one is that it has to spread, have established populations and spreading to other places. And the third is that it has to cause harm. And that is environmental or to human health or economic harm. So it has to satisfy those three characteristics for the government, the US government, the federal government at that, because states have their whole different um, ways of classifying species as, species as invasive. So a lot of times it's a problem really, and especially in invasion research, because I may consider it invasive, others might not. I have a specific study that I had a colleague from Europe, and we would get in these big discussions about whether a species should be classified as invasive or non-invasive. Um, it is still quite murky. Um, but we're doing advances on finding more quantitative ways to uh, bestow that classification. And that's actually part of my research. Uh, that's on one hand. On the one hand, can they become native again? Well, they were native, never native, but certainly there are invasives are a very small proportion of species that are non-native. So they're introduced from other areas that actually become problematic. There are many other species. I mean, you can probably imagine species, things, fruits that we eat, things like cows, I don't know, <laughs> um, that have been introduced from other areas and they don't cause, they might even cause, be worthy um, economically or just not do anything. That happens as well. And there's also species whose origins are cryptic, things like dandelions. We're not entirely sure if they were here <laughs> um, when they got here. So that there's a lot of murkiness when it comes to this area of study. Um, but they tend to be so damaging that um, they will change their landscapes in one way or the other, they have already. And if we want to protect the species that were native, a lot of times they outcompete these species or they eat these species all the way to extirpation, which means extension in a local area, we want to stop that. So maybe in the future, if we just let them go crazy, yeah, they'll be the dominant species in the area, but we don't necessarily want that. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, very quickly, I know we're running out of time. If folks want to stay to hear this last couple of questions, 
feel free to, again, the, this program is being recorded and it will be on our website and YouTube page. And the question is about the, um, the BTK biopesticide. Are there on other types of treatment available? Are there initiatives or knowledge by native, native communities that could be implemented? Um, or are there animals that feed on spongy moth? Yeah, all of these great questions. Um, when it comes to other chemicals, other pesti pesticide approaches used, um, there's a mating disruptor that is used that is highly specific to spongy moth. But the problem with it is that the efficacy of these treatments in high density areas is not very well understood. And it's also much more expensive than BTK. BTK is used all over the world because it's cheap and to produce um, and it's effective. So that's the problem there. Um, yes, there are other animals that eat it. In fact, small mammals eat them. So, like woodpeckers will eat them, but not enough. <laughs> not enough to um, make a change. There's also pathogens. Um, so it's been explored the possibility of using, there's a pathogen called Entomophaga mamaiga, I believe is the scientific name. Um, I wanna say it's a fungus, but I'm not sure. And it, um, it, it could, in areas where it gets cold and rainy during springs and summers, that is a driving force for um, declining populations of spongy moth. So it's something that's also been explored, but not entirely used in management in any way, probably because it's not as strong of a effect or as a consistent of an effect. Um, and that might be because it's not super well understood still. Now, um, when it comes to knowledge um, from uh, tribal peoples, uh, I don't know if management is, I'm not heavily involved with management. Um, and in fact, uh, this was a lot of my postdoctoral work. So I don't know, I hope so, but I don't know what's going on in terms of that. Um, I'm thinking if I have heard you know what? No, and it's something that maybe I'll bring up in the next meeting. There's a yearly meeting for spongy moth research and management. Um, for sure. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, thank you. I know uh, we have a couple more questions and we'll wrap it up really quickly. Um, a question from the audience was around action steps. Um, you know, as you're using data and working with numbers, what are some action steps or items that we as the audience can take to maybe prevent the spread? Uh, if that is helping to minimize it. Um, the question was really about around gardening. Do you advise um, that people identify them and kill them by hand? Is that an option? <laughs> yeah, well, killing them is great. I don't know. <laughs> the way that they outbreak, um, it might help, it might not help, but definitely kill them. But more than anything, notify um, whatever your forestry specialist is. I know that um in the in other areas you can either contact the department of natural resources i'm sure that here as well maybe folks from the forest preserves uh will guide you to the right contact because they'll know that maybe it is outbreaking in an area that they didn't take into account and might deploy treatments there um when it comes to things that everyone can do the most important thing is checking if you use wood for heating in your homes check for egg masses. That is very crucial. It's one of the drivers. We didn't find that it was as important as the seasonal temperatures, but it, it has been known to be a, um, a way that they spread like very long distance through that wood. Okay, good to know. And thank you again, Dr. Nunez for sharing your research with us. I know in the chat there was a comment, this is the coolest, most fun meeting they've been to all week. Um, so to everyone in the space also, please help me in thanking uh, our speaker for today. You can unmute yourselves, the reaction button. Um, I hope you all can join us in the next radical research for from BIPOC scholars. Um, this next Wednesday, April 19th at 3 p.m. with Dr. Ignacio Escalante Mesa from Biological Sciences as well.
Uh, you can register for this and other events hosted by the LCC on our website. I also encourage you to follow us on Instagram if you haven't. Um, and this brings our program to a close. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabby. And anyone can email me. Thank you for having me. And my email is there. It's GNM, really easy. So yeah. if you have any questions, thank you. We'll email you for sure all the questions <laughs> that were not answered. Thank awesome. you. <laughs> Bye, everyone.